We are going to talk about a really difficult subject. And, you know, it's kind of unfortunate that I wasn't able to be in class for this because this is a really hard thing to talk about because we're going to be focusing on the second half of Chapter 11, which is focused on workplace behavior. And I want to really focus on the aspect of workplace behavior that's been in the news a lot the past year plus. And that is the movement for reform of people's perspectives and views and support for sexual harassment, sexual assault. And what I'm going to do is try and talk about it as much as I can in the context of the workplace and how it relates to the workplace and not too much into, um, you know, I'm trying to think of the best way to put it and not too much outside of the workplace. How about we'll put it that way. We're going to try and stay on the, focused on the workplace as much as we can. Okay. So for this, you know, I, I'm going to expect and hope that you're open-minded to hearing me talk about a lot of really difficult issues. And I'm going to do my best to really offer as, as grounded a perspective as I can on this. Uh, but, you know, I may be challenging your viewpoints and talking about issues in a way that you haven't really been challenged before. And so I just ask that you be open to it. Okay, so we're going to focus today on some examples in the news the past year of sexual harassment and assault that have especially hurt people in the workplace. And then we're going to really delve into the two types of harassment that is prevalent um, as it relates to sexual misconduct in the workplace, that being hostile work environment um, and uh, quid pro quo. OK, so starting off, I wanted to kind of really discuss this from the starting point of how did we get here? Why is it a year and a half ago we, you know, sexual harassment, sexual assault was a big issue? But over a year later, we've seen dozens of well-known national figures um, be called out and either convicted or outed or seen as assaulter, as assaulters and harassers and have spawned the Me Too movement, um, which are, there has been much discussion. And so I wanted to point to two examples uh, that were very different in terms of in the workplace and in different work environments where well-known figures engage in sexual harassment or sexual assault and how it really changed the way we view it. So the first one I want to talk about, about why this is happening now, has to do with Judge Roy Moore. Okay, Judge Roy Moore. Wow, what, this, is a, this is an unfortunate guy here. So Roy Moore was a candidate for the Senate um, in Alabama in this past special election in 2017. And Roy Moore is um, when he was a judge in Alabama, uh, was had, had was outed to have had a sexual relationship when he was 31 years old with a 14 year old. In addition, Roy Moore was also banned from attending multiple malls in Alabama because he had been stalking un, um, girls under the age of 18. And he, you know, and he he ran and, you know, as a conservative in a very conservative state, um, or one of the most conservative states, and lost. And he lost in part because the claims of pedophilia and assault and harassment due to a lack of consent being that far under the age of 18, people across the board were pretty horrified. And, 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 he, and he was not voted into office despite being an overwhelming favorite starting the race. Uh, and what it demonstrated, much like the next example we're going to tell, is that there are, we, we are starting to, as a society, realize that it is possible and we should put aside our political viewpoints when we see act in a way, see people act in a way that has been so destructive because there has been more discussion about the impact that harassment and assault has had. And the other one that, again, this feels like a long time ago, especially with Judge Brett Kavanaugh and how that has, um, and how that you know, caused a lot of discussion in our society and with the Senate hearings. Um, the next one that fell under the radio, radar. So this is Senator Al Franken, I should say former senator. And as you can see in this picture, one of the things he's doing is he is unfortunately groping this woman who at the time was an active duty member of the military while they were flying together um, on, on a, a military airplane. And a little backstory here, um, the woman who this happened to is now a radio host and she was sent this picture and she had decided for because she had you know thought for a long time what should i do because al franken a little background on him a very famous comedy writer for saturday night live in the 80s and early 90s famous comedian 
He then uh, ran to become senator of Minnesota and won, I believe it was in 2006. And he was mentioned as, before this came out, as maybe even a presidential candidate. But when, uh, you know, but when this woman came forward on her radio show, released the picture and made a statement, uh, she had said that I feel violated by this man groping me when I was asleep um, on an airplane. And other women came forward and, uh, that accused Senator Franken of sexual harassment. Um, and at first, you know, he was well liked by his party and he looked like he was going to survive it. Then enough people called him to step down. And what I find unfortunate um, about this situation is there are a lot of people um, in, in the Democratic Party of, um, of Senator Franken who said, oh, man, we shouldn't have look, we shouldn't have caught, you know, we shouldn't have forced them out. Other people have done worse, like President Trump has been accused of worse. President Clinton has been accused of worse. My issue with that is, is it doesn't, is that it uses politics and it uses ideological viewpoints to cover over the fact that harassment and assault happened. And that harassment and assault is an enormous issue in this country that people are starting to realize just how terrible it is. Um, and that's where I wanted to really start today and discuss is, what is sexual harassment first? Then how does it manifest itself in the workplace and workplace behaviors? And what can we do about it? That's the other part to this. So sexual harassment, as I've, I have here on the definition, is where there are advances or behaviors or standards of norms that encourage or take part in a, of something of sexual nature, and that those advances or behaviors are unwanted by the receiver of the message. Okay? Unwanted by the receiver being key here. One of the things we know about harassment and assault is that it is an issue where I'm trying to think of the best way to put this. It is an issue where our norms have changed over time, and I would argue they are getting better. They're still not as good as they need to be, but they are getting better. Um, an example of this is how specific states like California have changed their, what's the legal definition of consent. Because that's the, that's the important part of this definition, right? For something to be harassment or assault, it, it, it is non-consensual. And before, it used to be, um, and many states still have this, so I shouldn't say before, that is consent meant did that person say no. So if there was, if there was a sexual advance or a kind of a sexual situation taking place between two people, was there no ever stated? The problem with that standard that advocates who wanted to change it came forward with is no assumes that I feel like I have the safety and comfortability and the power to say no, right? And if I say, for example, I'm um, feeling scared or I'm feeling my life is threatened or I'm feeling unsafe, I may be afraid to say no because I don't know how the person who's engaging in sexual behavior with me is going to respond. And one of the chance standards that got changed is to go instead of no for consent, that is, was there an affirmative yes? And was there a consistent yes? Um, and this, again, there's been discussion over is this too far, but I think the nature of it is important, right? That is, if I'm going to engage in a sexual behavior, I should consistently throughout that advancement or that act feel comfortable and, and, and want to consent to it. And so that change in no to affirmative consent has been key as people recognize sexual harassment is all about consent. And so we have to think of what is non-consensual and therefore that is the behaviors that, that should be, we should change our framework of understanding for it. Okay, so that's sexual harassment. And I wanna kind of really first, before diving into the two types, give you some context on why this in the workplace has been such a big issue, okay? So you're gonna notice the statistics I have here are, are a lot about how women experience it. And the unfortunate reality is so much of sexual harassment, um, an overwhelming majority of it is men harassing women and assaulting women. Now that is obviously not every case. We are gonna talk about examples um, of when women have harassed men and when have women have harassed other women. Um, there are many examples, unfortunately, Kevin Spacey being one of a man who has harassed and assaulted multiple other men. And that's where it is easy to draw overall conclusions, but there are definitely still many examples that do not fit within the traditional understanding of assault or harassment. But it is important to note the overwhelming, um, you know, overwhelming majority of statistics stating something specific. 
So if you look at these stats, half of all American women have experienced or reported some form of unwanted and inappropriate or sexual advance. 30% of women have endured such behavior from male colleagues and 25% identified men with sway over their careers as the culprits. 71% of sexual harassment in the workplace is not reported. And this is unfortunately the crux of the issue. And this goes beyond just the workplace, but it's important to talk about it in the workplace because that's where we're going next. One of the biggest issues why I would argue that the Me Too movement had not really started beforehand is that for so long, there was a way, there was this assumption that people, especially women who came forward with claims of sexual harassment or assault, that didn't have video evidence or have a, a lot of other corroborating witnesses, the assumption is they must be making it up or they must be exaggerating or they must have a grudge against this person. And what we're finding more and more, and one of the things I've been discussing more and more, is that the evidence we have does not back that up. The National Sexual Assault uh, Reporting Center states that between 2 and 10 percent of sexual assaults and rapes that are come forward in terms of um, that that are accusations are made um, in a court of law, between 2 and 10 percent are are deemed falsified. Now, that number, as as you can see, is not always holistic of every state of every form of harassment that gets reported. But what it does demonstrate is that overwhelmingly people who come forward are not lying, that they may not have, they may not have um, other corroborating witnesses or may not have video evidence, but the way in which they describe it, the way in which um, the behavior of that person um, has been validated in other areas starts to paint the general picture that this person is telling the truth. And that's an important reality that I think more and more people are waking up to. That is, Due process is always important, right? There should always be a fair proceedings anytime you have any accusation in the court of law. But it is also important to look at statistics like that to say, if there are so many barriers and so few people report, those that do come forward, we probably should take their claims seriously and really truly investigate it. Um, and that's where it leads into a discussion of sexual harassment of the types of it. So the first type is quid pro quo. And quid pro quo means in Latin this for that. And quid pro quo can have you know, implications beyond just sexual harassment. That is essentially, you do this for me, I'll do that for you. Um, in context of sexual harassment or sexual assault, it usually means the use of sexual favors or comments for promotion of job requirement, or, and this is a really unfortunate case, that is when someone reports sexual harassment, but because of the reporting, they are demoted or punished in some way in the workplace. And both of these sound pretty terrible, but unfortunately some of you in the class may have experienced this in some way, shape or form. Um, someone making sexual advances or behaviors towards you um, and really making it so you feel pressured to say yes because of what they did. And the, the poster child for this is a truly despicable human being. There's no dis disputing this. And that is Harvey Weinstein. Some of you may know the name, you may not recognize his face. Harvey Weinstein was a film producer and in charge of a film production company. He, over the past year and a half, approximately, I've lost track at this point, it is somewhere around 40 or 50 women has claimed that he either harassed or assaulted or raped them at some point. And many of these were in part because of workplace violations. One of his common moves that many actresses had pointed out in their descriptions of what he did is that he would ask them into his hotel room and he would say, I think that you have a good chance to get this part, but you will only get this part if you have sex with me. Um, other times he was not even going that far as to try and, 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 and engage them into having it. Sometimes he would block the doorway and force them um, physically, physically overpower them to have sex with him. And he, this happened to enough women that finally it came out and people started to come out more and more against him and he was tried and convicted. But unfortunately, he was allowed to continue to use these tactics to assault and rape women over many years. And that's in part because quid pro quo is very prevalent in the workplace and instances like Harvey Weinstein um, are all too common. The second one 
is hostile work environment. And this is one that probably, you know, is common more so because it can be as small as like a flirtatious or percept or, per, you know, a perceptively uh, flirtatious comment, or it could be something far, far more, um, more problematic um, and, and kind of forced sexual advances consistently in the work environment. And hostile work environment can really be in, in either of those spectrums or it could be in the middle. Anything from an inappropriate flirtatious comment to a truly monstrous um, assault or rape in the workplace um, over a consistent period of time. And hostile work environment, again, takes many forms. But one that I wanted to point to, and I mentioned before how we do need to update our understanding of, of sexual harassment and sexual assault. And one that was allowed to persist for a while because people didn't really see it this way um, initially until someone came forward is this former CEO um, of a feminine products company. Her name is Mickey Agrawal. And she was CEO of this feminine products company. And she was very well known in kind of this business circles in that area of being very progressive and, it and having a very different stance for her company. She would, uh, she talked a lot about in her statements of why her company was succeeding for a while, that she wanted to change discussions over female sexuality. She didn't, women, didn't want women to feel ashamed of their bodies or ashamed of, of their menstrual cycles and talked a lot about those to try and overcome stigma. So a lot of people applauded her. Um, a lot of people supported her. Then one of her employees uh, came forward with um, claims of sexual harassment in the workplace um, of that is, in this case, a hostile work environment. So all of her employees were women. And her one of her employees had come forward in an affidavit that said um, that Mickey Agrawal uh, would ask employees to change in her office. She would come up and grab their breasts and grab other areas of their body and their genitals areas um, just to say, like, hey, how are you feeling? Or, wow, you know, your breasts look really nice. She herself would change in front of her employees and say, hey, how do I look in this bra? Or how, how does my butt look today? Um, she would do a lot of things like that. And when the employee came forward, Mickey Agrawal actually really didn't dispute a whole lot of what was said. Um, what her argument was is that, hey, I'm a progressive person. I like to have a progressive work environment where people, you know, are challenged stigmas of their bodies and of how they look and, and things like that. The problem, as much as people may applaud that and say that's great, I tend to think of that as someone who's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Because what it doesn't recognize is that you may have an intent of how you think you're acting, but sexual harassment and assault, as we talked about in the definition, is about consent of the receiver, right? How is the receiver understanding and perceiving these advances? If they are perceiving them as a way that makes them feel unsafe or uncomfortable in ways that meet definitions of harassment and assault, then that's obviously bad and that shouldn't happen, right? And that's the issue I think here with Mickey Agrawal and why we, in the, especially in the workplace, as we communicate with others and we think about how can we prevent these issues from being so prevalent in the future, is that we have to always think about, I may have been raised a certain way to make certain jokes or to find certain things funny or to in, flirt or engage um, in, in showing attraction to other people in specific ways. But if you hear from others that they do not find that funny or safe or accepting or if you are in, or or ways that challenge their consent, we need to recognize and see that's bad. And the key thing I want to bring this up with, um, and and part of why this is such a big topic for me, and I really spend so much time thinking of the examples and how to discuss it in class is. In college, one big thing that happened to me is, and I look back on with great regret, is that there were many women in my life who would go to fraternity parties in my fraternity would hang out with us and would tell me and a few of my pledge brothers that they were being harassed and in one case assaulted by our pledge brothers. And I essentially would do not always, but usually the bare minimum. That is, I'm so sorry. That's terrible. Like you should tell someone. And that would be it. And I was able to live with myself for a while before I knew more information. But what I realized is I, that is not enough. I, as someone who 
you know, show, should show support for victims of assault and harassment, should challenge that behavior, right? Should call it out when I see it. Talk to others who I see engaging in it or who I know engaging in it and explain why it's wrong and why it needs to stop. Alert authorities. Encourage people to go to the authorities and file Title IX uh, reports or file police reports. And I say that because, unfortunately, there are too many barriers who in college. That is, there are too many people like me when I was in college of who are not harassing or assaulting, but could have done a lot more to help and support those who were. And I just want to make sure that at the end here, the reason why you know you know this is important, why we talk about this, and why we're doing the um, the Me Too assignment is harassment in the workplace is oftentimes enabled not because an overwhelming majority of people harasses or assault, though there are too many. It's because not enough people who are good stand up and do anything. And that's what hopefully you've learned today is to spot it, to know the impact of it, and to do something about it. Okay? All righty, everyone. Thank you for really sitting through a tough lecture. Um, I do want to make sure that you note, after watching this lecture, please answer the discussion question that I post on Blackboard. Alrighty, thank you everyone. Have a great holiday weekend. Uh, thank you to our veterans, those of you who are vets or who have family who have served. Make sure to hug them tight and thank them this weekend, as hopefully you do all the time, but especially as we celebrate them on Monday. Um, I will see you all on Tuesday. Have a great weekend.